Ladies and gentlemen, that is how you properly do a battle between giants. And this is Pacific Rim. The only movie I've seen so far to pull off the plot of big robot fight big monster in a really cool fashion. Seriously, after watching this movie as a kid, I couldn't ever walk in the shallow end of the pool the same way, because I would imagine myself as a Jaeger. Y yeah, don't. Don't make fun of me. Now, in Pacific Rim, the kaijus, aka big monsters, are put into categories of 1 through 5, all of them with very different looks and abilities, as they can range from looking like some mutated lizard and bat hybrid that can fly, to a big fat gorilla with an EMP bomb. The Jaegers are also categorized by what mark they are, kinda like Iron Man. But I think it's time to address the Jaeger in the room. What makes the movie so good? Well, yes, I know, it's a giant robot fighting giant monsters movie, but that doesn't mean anything if it didn't feel real and had stakes. And this is something Pacific Rim does very well, in my opinion. Let's start with the Jaegers. The most obvious thing is that they feel slow and mechanical, which makes sense for their immense size. But it's not just that. It's the way the camera shakes as they walk across the landscape. It's the way the roads get completely crushed underneath their feet as they traverse through the city. It's the way that it puts you in the first person perspective as if you're a bystander on the streets as you see the Jaeger walk by. It's the fact that you can hear the mechanical parts and hydraulics struggling to lift the immense weight of its body parts as it moves. You know what other movie nailed these concepts? Iron Man. The older Iron Man movies made the suit feel real because you could see, hear, and feel the robotic parts of the suit. And just like how we can see the different parts of Iron Man's suit being assembled and see the actual moving parts inside of it, Pacific Rim did the same thing. All these details combined with a steady supply of camera angles that let us experience the true size of the Jaegers from a bunch of different perspectives makes them feel alive. But of course, it's not just that. The world feels alive as well. We also get to see people running on the streets, panicking to get into shelters to hide, and throughout the fights we get constant reminders that there are stakes at hand. Like for example, in this shot, Gypsy messes up and allows the kaiju to push him into a bridge, knocking it over and we can actually see some of the cars falling down. This was a mistake, but the fact that there are actual consequences in the middle of the fight for making mistakes just makes the movie all that much better. And instead of these stakes being told to us by one of the characters, like for example someone saying, Oh no man, the weight of the world is on your shoulders man, if you die here, the whole world ends. Hey, she's trying to take over the world. So? That thing's laying waste to the whole damn world. Hey, Harley, she's trying to take over the world. Lady, you are evil. Anyways, let's just get into what happens in the movie. It starts with Rally and his brother suiting up and being all swag and stuff. That is, until they fight the first ever Category 3 and shit hits the fan. Rally, listen to me! The Jaegers start dropping like flies and being completely destroyed all over the world. And as a last resort, they find a way to bring a nuclear bomb to the breach, the gateway that allows kaijus to come to our world and blow shit up. The thing is, up until the point where Gypsy got defeated, humanity has basically been wrecking these kaijus with the Jaegers. Like, I mean, wiping the floor with these things. So you might be asking, But Film Junkie, why do we start losing all of a sudden? Well, ladies and gentlemen, don't worry. You see, I believe I have a bit of a theory on my hands. Now, in the plot of Pacific Rim, these kaijus are basically soldiers sent to destroy and colonize planets, and they do this for the beings called the Precursors. The thing is, throughout the first parts of the movie, we're kinda led to believe these kaijus are kinda huge, stupid monsters that walk around and poop on everything. One cubic meter of crap has enough phosphorus in it! To fertilize a whole field. But clearly, this isn't the case, as it's actually the precursors making the decisions. They're basically the brains behind the whole thing. Now, Jaegers basically never got screwed up until the fight with Gypsy Danger and Knifehead, and this is because in this fight, the precursors discovered a critical weakness of the Jaegers, and that is that the pilots are almost always located in the head. You can notice even during the fight with Gypsy, Knifehead didn't know this and was continually brute force attacking the main body of the Jaeger. 
later, with a head attack simply being an accident when it clawed at Gypsy. However, because unlike the Kaiju minions, the precursors are actually big brain world conquerors, they used this new knowledge to absolutely wreck all the Jaegers across the world. Hence why Jaegers started dropping like flies ever since Gypsy lost that fight. So now you might be asking, but Film Junkie, if they knew to attack the head of the Jaeger, why does some Jaeger still manage to survive? <laughs> well, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, fear not, for I have an answer to that too. You see, all the surviving Jaegers are special in some way. And no, I'm not talking about them being that kind of special. Let's start with the Russian Jaeger Cherno Alpha, since it's the most obvious one. As you can see, it doesn't really have a head. So yeah, the Kaiju were probably pretty confused for this one. As for Crimson Typhoon, it's super agile and has three arms with giant blades attached to each end of them, once again making it stand out from the typical Jaeger. And the final one, Striker Eureka, is the fastest and speediest son of a factory to ever be made. Not to mention, it has six cannons in its chest. I believe all these special attributes and qualities made these Jaegers stand out, and since the Kaiju either didn't know or couldn't exploit their weaknesses, they stood undefeated. However, this all changed once one of the Kaiju scientists, Newt, drifted with the Kaiju brain later on in the movie. You goddamn moron. You see, this drifting tech he used is the same technology that allows pilots and Jaegers to basically meld their minds together. The problem, however, is that it's a pathway that goes both ways. It's just of a connection! Both ways. You see the other person's memory and they see yours. Newt probably had a pretty good understanding of all the active Jaegers, and so in turn he knew all their weaknesses and strengths, meaning the precursors now had access to that information after he did the drift with the kaiju brain. Now from what we saw in the movie, we found out that all the kaiju are clones. Now this one here was harvested in Sydney, and this was harvested in Manila six years ago. They have the same exact DNA. They're clones. Which means they've been specifically designed by the precursors and are used as a bioweapon of sorts. So what we saw in the movie as a result of this was that the kaiju sent through the breach after the drift happened with Newt were specifically picked or designed to counter the remaining Jaegers. The big fat gorilla guy had an EMP to fry the electronics of the newest and most deadly Jaeger, Striker Eureka. The one that looks like a lizard and bat hybrid had a tail with a claw that was perfect for bypassing the agility and the three armed blade technique of Crimson Typhoon, going straight for its relatively smaller and weaker head. It also had Acid Spit, which perfectly counters Cherno Alpha, as it doesn't really have a head and is heavily armored. The only one that wasn't accounted for was Gypsy Danger, because at the time it was still inactive, and so maybe Newt didn't know as much about it as the other ones. Keep in mind, this is five years after Gypsy was defeated, and I don't think it's been deployed ever since then. Gypsy is analog and runs on nuclear power, which means the EMP doesn't work on him, and he's agile enough to dodge the acid spit, as well as exploit some of the weaknesses of the lizard bat kaiju, so clearly the precursors didn't know much about Gypsy. Yeah, realizing all of this actually took place makes an already awesome movie even more awesome. This leads me to one satisfying conclusion, and that is I'm really glad this movie never got a sequel, because if it did, it probably wouldn't apply all these qualities in the right way and make it have the same satisfying realism. In fact, it might even ruin the potential for a Pacific Rim universe. Thankfully, that didn't happen, right?